Orthopedic Research and Education Foundation India. Today we have our chairman, Dr. John Mukhopadhyay, sir, who is teaching us about clavicle fracture. So over to you, sir. Okay, uh, good evening, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully we can get started. Uh, Is that okay? Mm, yes, sir. It's full screen, sir. Yeah? Uh, yes, Are you sir. okay? Yes, sir. Okay, so I think uh, this is an area where we... has been a lot of changes in the recent past. And uh, it was a fracture which was... Uh, really managed conservatively in almost every situation till a few years ago. Uh, however, there's been a sudden uh, explosion in the number of these that get fixed based on a paper which we will discuss. But whether it's really justifiable to fix all these clavicles is something that needs to be considered. By and large, uh, talking about the anatomy, we all aware of the sigmoid-shaped long bone, which is has a convex surface along its medial end and a concave surface along the lateral part, if you look at it from the front. Uh, and this provides the connection between the axial and appendicular skeleton for the upper limb. Okay, the mechanism of... Uh, Injury is usually a fall on the shoulder or outstretched arm. Um, some may be most uh, low energy fractures. Uh, others can be high energy fractures depending on the situation in which they are fractured, especially in road traffic accidents. They tend to be higher energy fractures and often associated with uh, chest injuries and maybe sometimes even injuries to the brachial plexus, etc., which you need to rule out in your initial assessment. Okay, uh, the deforming forces are really the muscles which are attached to the clavicle. You have the trapezius, the sternocleidomastoid, and the weight of the arm and the pectoralis major uh, muscle which is attached to it, which all uh, have play a part in the um, deforming forces and the displacement that occurs with the fracture. Okay, so that is important to understand. Uh, now, like I said, there was a general perception that these are non-troublesome fractures, they heal rapidly, there may be some cosmetic concern, and that non-unions and malunions were usually asymptomatic and really did not need treatment. And I think we also uh, really approached them like that till quite recently. And I'll tell you what changed my uh, thinking. Uh, so if you looked at the earlier reports by near, there were three out of 2,235 fractures, which did not heal with conservative treatment, while two out of 45 with operative treatment did not heal or went into non-union. So actually had more non-unions in the operative group. And similarly, Rho uh, in 1968 came out with this paper which showed more non-unions with conservative uh, with operative treatment than conservative treatment. Now, but if you look at more recent reports, the non-union rates are much higher. Uh, the unsatisfactory outcomes are also much higher and these two papers uh, seem to suggest that. Uh, this is possibly related to, one is the increased survival of patients with polytrauma where they have high energy clavicle fractures, which then uh, have a more, a greater chance of going on to non-unions. It also may be dependent on the expectations of people where people earlier were satisfied if they could basically use the arm. Now, wants to have a perfect result. And of course, you follow them up more closely, you see more uh, problems and complications than if you did not follow up these patients. So really the paper which set um, this uh, trend of thinking of operating on these fractures was this from the Canadian Orthopedic Trauma Society, 
in 2007, and then there was a follow-up uh, study of that, which was a prospective randomized clinical trial, which 132 patients in the dis with displaced uh, uh, fractures of the clavicle were randomized. Okay, and they compared pa patient-oriented outcomes and complication rates following non-operative treatment and those after plate fixations of displaced mid-shaft clavicular fractures. So that was the basic aim of the study. And they found that operative fixation of a displaced fracture of the shaft of clavicle resulted in improved functional outcome. There were lower rates of malunion, which I can understand, non-unions compared to non-operative treatment at one year of follow-up. That was also there in the study. Uh, hardware removal was one of the main issues uh, which were of concern in the operative group. And the study in its uh, conclusion supported the primary plate fixation of completely displaced mid-shaft clavicular fractures in the active adult patients. So they didn't really define clearly what they meant by completely displaced fractures. But the, in this study, the, both the constant scores were much better in the operative group, while the DASH scores, that means the disability scores, were much lower in the operative group as compared to the conservative group. So this study really set about people uh, treating these with operative treatment and uh, possibly the pendulum really swung the other way in that people were over-operating on these fractures. There were some uh, complications both in the non-operative group and the operative group. And in the non-operative group, you had more symptomatic malunions and non-unions. And there was one case which secondarily became an open fracture. That means you had the bones tenting the skin and then became uh, an open fracture and therefore needed surgery. Okay, And uh, they had one patient who had uh, features of uh, chronic regional place uh, uh, pain syndrome or reflex uh, sympathetic dystrophy, so RSD. While in the operative group, it was local plate irritation which required removal, which was there in five, late wound dehiscence and infection in three, early hardware failure in one, and non union in one. So they only had one non union. Okay. So overall, they felt that the complication rates were less. But if you look at the complications, obviously the operative group, when they had complications, were more severe. And there were certain concerns about the study that the loss of follow-up in the conservative treatment group was much higher. Okay, so 13 out of 62 were not followed up, followed up in the operate in the non-operative group. Okay. They did not give economic data in terms of the cost of treatment. And there's a potential reporting bias of the open reduction and internal fixation, as in any other part that is treated with operative treatment. Okay, so then people started to look at which were the fractures which probably did badly with conservative treatment. And this study by Notquist et al. Uh, showed that if there was less than 5 millimeter shortening, most patients had an acceptable result. Uh, and this was a study uh, which was followed up up to five years. But if they had more than 20 millimeters shortening, there was increased risk with associated with non-unions and poor functional outcomes. And this was a study by Hill et al. in JBJS. Okay, so these two studies close to each other. Uh, tried to look at what factors caused more problems. So generally, if there's a shortening of more than 20 millimeters, it may be considered a good indication for operative treatment. Okay, so this uh, study, Postachini et al., looked at analyzing overlap and craniocaudal displacement on radiographs. So um, as, you, as uh, I will uh, come to later, is that we... Uh, tend to assess clavicle fractures on just one x-ray, unlike any other bone. And they concluded that surgery was indicated in patients with an overlap of more than 13%. So they looked at the overall length and the amount of overlap. And if this was 13%, 
that was uh, considered an indication for surgery or if there was a craniocaudal displacement okay of more than 2 cm that means up and down displacement of more than 2 cm so this would be the situation where one end is poking out of skin almost poking out of skin and these would be indications for where you might consider surgery, surgery because there's a danger of that spike of bone coming out through skin. Now, is there a classification for this? Yes. Uh, there's the Allman's classification, which really divided it into three groups depending on where the fracture was. So the middle third injuries, which comprised the majority of the injuries, were group one. The group two were the distal third, that means the lateral end of the fracture clavicles. And the group three fractures were the medial or the proximal part of the uh, bone. And these were really the most uh, least common fractures. Now, when we looked at them at the AO classification, the proximal or the medial segment became 15.1. 15 was the number assigned to the clavicle. 15.2 was the diaphyseal part. And 15.3 was the lateral end of clavicle. And this could be further divided into the classical AO classification where if it was art, the, on the articular side or the proximal or distal end, it could be extra articular, partial articular or complete articular. While if it was in the mid shaft, it could be simple, wedged or comminuted. And then they could be further classified. So this was the correlation with the AO classification. Now the lateral end of the uh, clavicle fracture was uh, further uh, sort of looked at and this uh, uh, classification which is used for the lateral end of clavicle this is by uh, the study by Bias et al glass et al and they looked at various types going from type 1 type 2a and 2b type 3 type 4 and 5 and they concluded that the type 2 and the type 4 were the more unstable varieties uh, what they uh, looked at was important because there was a period when uh, all lateral end fractures were considered a surgical candidates. Now it's only the unstable group which should be considered for surgery. Now uh, I talked about the radiology that for the clavicle for some reason everyone or most people accept one single x-ray on their decision making. I think it's really important to get additional views you could get the oblique views, uh, kephalad and cordad, or different angles at kephalad. Uh, Quesada suggested a view which uh, included three views, a standard AP, a 45 degree cordad, and a 45 degree kephalad, very akin to what we do in the pelvis with the iliac and obturator views. Okay, so or the uh, inlet and outlet views for the pelvis. That means you, to see the full extent of the displacement, you really need uh, views in different directions because the clavicle is kind of obliquely placed in the body. Okay, so these are the views. You can also do things like strike or notch view, apical, oblique, or abduction, or dotic views. Just to show you that a fracture which looks like this on the AP X-ray, which looks uh, relatively undisplaced or one where the displacement is not so significant, when you do your other views, you can see the amount of displacement that is shown up in the other views. So because the displacement is not necessarily just craniocaudal, it could also be anteroposterior. We really need to see the three views or at least two views to make a decision on the clavicle fracture. Now, as I said, uh, I still feel that conservative treatment works well for a lot of these fractures. So a fracture like this, which uh, many people today would rush to operating, can be managed conservatively. And I'll just show you a couple. So this was treated conservatively with a sling. Now you can treat it with a brace or a sling. Uh, clinic. Uh, the studies which have been there really show not much difference between just a sling or a figure of eight bandage or a figure of eight brace. And so that is your choice what you treat them with. And you can see how in the follow-up this has gone on to heal with a full functional recovery and no uh, significant cosmetic deformity either. Okay, so here's another case, much more displaced, younger patient. Uh, this was what he came to us with at about four, uh, seven, five to six weeks uh, since the injury. 
And we decided to treat this conservatively. And you can see at follow-up, they settled about three months. And this is at about a one year. You can see how this has also gone on to heal with a full functional recovery. And you can't see any significant bump there anymore. So I think conservative treatment definitely has a role. I think you need to talk to your patients, explain to them the advantages and disadvantages. And I think it's often better to try and allow them to make the decision after you've given the pros and cons of the both of the operative and conservative treatment. Because remember, operative treatment has a certain complication rate and some of these complications can be serious. So what are your definitive indications for surgical treatment of clavicle fractures? Really, if you just look at it, it's open fractures and associated neurovascular injury. Of course, if you have a vascular injury or a open fracture, these are situations where you would definitely consider operative treatment. Uh, whether you fix the clavicle or not is a different concept, but you need to operate, you need to debride, you need to, if there's a vascular injury, deal with that. And then usually you would want to stabilize the clavicle as well. Now, the relative indications could be very widely displaced fractures. And I told you some of the criteria we use to decide that. Polytrauma or multiple trauma patients, again, there may be some advantage, both in terms of the chest function as well as in mobilizing these patients and the floating shoulder. So if you have a situation where there is a floating shoulder with a scapular fracture as well as a clavicle fracture or involvement of the superior shoulder suspensory ligaments, then you would think of surgery. So here's an example. You can see there's a clavicular neck fracture, a scapular neck fracture with significant displacement, medialization, as well as a alteration of the glenopolar angle. You can see the CT scan showing the full extent of the displacement. And here we had to fix both the clavicle and the scapula so that the patient had a good function and early uh, range of motion. Now, their relative indications could be the cosmetic deformity. And this, sometimes if they have a big bump, uh, initially, you may consider that. Uh, sometimes it could be for earlier return to work, uh, where patients want to get back to work. And by fixing them, you may be able to mobilize them earlier. And another indication could be bilateral fractures, where trying to put them in a sling for both sides becomes a problem. So here's an example of a lady who presented to us with bilateral displaced fractures. And here's a situation where you would do it in the supine position. Many clavicles, if you're putting the plate on top, we do it on a, a beach chair position. But here, because you want to approach both sides, you can do it in a supine position. So here's both sides being fixed uh, at the same sitting, means one after the other, but at the same I've been one surgery. Uh, those were the post-op x-rays. And here we put a anterior plate rather than a superior plate or an antero-inferior plate as, they, as it's usually called. Uh, we'll discuss some of the advantages and disadvantages. And this is at 10 months follow-up. You can see how both sides have gone on to heal. And she's got a normal function in, of both her shoulders. So plate fixation is the traditional means of open reduction and internal fixation of these fractures. And usually the plate was applied superiorly. Uh, but today, some people would apply them inferiorly. And you have plates which are designed for both uh, purposes. If it's a lateral fracture, then the lateral plate as it's designed is for the superior surface. But for the shaft fracture, you have a VA plate today, which is now designed for the anterior inferior surface. Okay. Now, there are certain precautions you need to take. So, if you're putting a superior plate, it's good to do it in a beach chair position. You have to be very careful with your dissection. Now, there's this uh, eternal debate about the supraclavicular nerves, and you, you have to make your own decision on them. If you try to protect them, they often get very stretched. Or if you just divide them, then some people say that they have problems with a neuroma, etc. But I feel it's worse if you really stretch them out. And um, we have not really been taking a great amount of care to protect the supraclavicular nerves. And we have no, uh, I mean, we do question our patients about 
the numbness, etc. And the uh, kind of complaints are very minimal so far in our study anyway, in our group of patients. Okay, you need a good quality drill. So don't use a sort of a very heavy drill that vibrates around too much. And make sure we make it a point that every case for the clavicle, we use a brand new drill bit. The reason is that you don't want your drill bit to suddenly plunge across the surface of the clavicle once you hit the far cortex. So use it very carefully, hold your arm very carefully and drill very carefully when you're going to the far cortex. Okay, measure the screw lengths very accurately because you don't want excessively long screws and you need to contour these plates depending on where you're putting them. Of course, you do have the pre-contoured plates available today. Now, we talked about the anterior inferior plating and one of the advantages of this is that you can get much longer screws in the lateral part as you can see here. Okay, you get screws which may be 20, 22 or even 24 millimeters in length as opposed to the supero inferior screws, which can be 14 or 16, or even a maximum 18 millimeters in length, okay? Uh, also, the hardware tends to be less prominent. We haven't had too many major problems, but we've had one or two patients where the hardware, you can literally see the imprint of the plate, especially in the very thin patient, okay? Now, if you look at biomechanical studies, the superior plate seems to be better but with the lock plates, uh, adequate stability can be got with the anterior plates or anterior inferior plates. Okay, uh, so now we come to uh, the type of uh, plating you should do. And if you use very flimsy plates like a one third tubular plate, remember there's a lot of forces across the clavicle. And this is what the patient came to us with within three months of the fixation. So this is not something you want to see. So personally, we use uh, we used to use DCP and now we use the LCP for most of our clavicle fractures. Uh, but do not use the one third tubular blades and certainly not for non-unions. So what are the other methods of fixation? So they are intramedullary devices. Uh, so in Australia, this large threaded cannulated screw is quite popular. The flexible elastic nail or the titanium elastic nail has become popular in Europe uh, more recently. Uh, however, that uh, enthusiasm for it has probably waned a little bit. Um, things like K-wires and tension band wires uh, is something which we avoid nowadays. They have been used. There could be a possibility of the wire migrating and there has been a report of a while and ending up in, in the heart or some, uh, similar, something similar. And they the only time you would use this is when, for some reason, where the plate is contraindicated, okay? Uh, the fixation with the nails is less secure. We There was a patch about 10, 15 years ago where we did quite a few of these titanium elastic nails with reasonable success, but... Uh, we did not feel that we got the same amount of stability and we were not able to mobilize them as early with the nails. Now, this study uh, was one of the first studies showing the success of the titanium elastic nail where all their cases uh, united, but four of them had skin irritation. This is one of our cases where you can see there's a significant displaced fracture. And if there's distraction of the fracture, that's very often a sign of a high energy trauma. So here we fixed it with this. Again, you can see how it's gone on to heal nicely. This is the bandage after we had taken out the implant, but he did have a bit of irritation on the medial leg where the nail was a little prominent, but it went on to do well. Now, very often you need to combine it with a small open reduction to help you guide the, the elastic nail across the fracture because rather than struggling uh, blindly with that, and getting into problems because there are many important structures. It is If you don't get it easily, just make a small incision and then see the fracture ends and guide the wire across the part and then you get a good fixation. There are also problems and this study showed a significant reoperation rate of 36% and almost 70% who had some kind of complication, not necessarily very significant or very major complications, but 
some type of combination. And they concluded that it can be technically demanding and with a significant complication rate in the post-operative phase. Uh, Gollish et al. also looked at the biomechanical performance of blades versus intramedullary nails and not surprisingly, the 3.5 millimeter dynamic compression plate uh, was a more uh, sort of uh, superior fixation device in terms of giving a better construct or a stronger construct with uh, greater loads which you could uh, sustain uh, in these fractures as compared to a, a nail. Uh, the lateral third fractures, as I mentioned, is a kind of a separate kettle uh, of fish. And uh, this is interesting because this is one of those fractures where uh, Nia in 1968 said that 30% end up in non-unions and had a greater indication for surgery. But nowadays we've gone on to looking at the unstable varieties which need fixation. Uh, various things have been tried, including uh, screws, the Bosworth screw, which goes into the uh, coracoid process, K wires, which we would avoid today. Uh, uh, combined with tapes, you can combine internal fixation with some of these uh, suture tapes. And today you have various devices, such as the um, uh, elastic devices to uh, fixed to the coracoid, um, and these are supposed to be superior, but really the lit the jury is still out on these, and you have to make your own decision on which is the best method of fixation. The hook plate is useful for the very lateral fractures where you cannot get a very good hold based on your screws, and this depends on the hook which goes under the acromion and when you put the plate onto the bone, it makes sure that the bone is uh, the medial part or the proximal part remains in line with the uh, distal part of the clavicle and therefore gives it a chance to heal. Okay, so this is uh, important for small distal fragments and this is how it goes. You can get a couple of screws into the distal fragment, but it's really on this hook that it depends and you need to check the level of the hook to get the right reduction. And you can sometimes combine it with a Bosworth screw. So this is him after it's healing. Here's another patient with a very lateral fracture. You can see there's instability. Uh, if, and this, as you can see this, you need to look at it in both views and a CT is more useful because you can see there's a significant displacement in another plane as opposed to the just the supero inferior plane. And that is something also that you need to look at. And here we use the hook plate along with the Bosworth screw to give us a very stable fixation, which then went on to heal well. Okay, and this was after the implant was removed. You can see how the fracture is healed, and he had a good function as well. But one of the problems with this uh, hook plate is very often it erodes into this undersurface of the clavicle, and can also lead to impingement. So uh, often requires removal. We usually advise them removal uh, within three to within six months, usually after three months, but before th six months, once we are sure that the fracture has healed. Other methods like tension band wiring or uh, fixation, which actually extends into the acromion, have been tried in the earlier days. Not something we use very often, but occasionally you will have a case where you may have to combine a tension band wiring with your plate fixation where the fractures are very comminuted and very distal. Now, you also have this uh, locking plate for the lateral part of the clavicle with multiple screw options in the lateral end. So you have almost six or seven, 2.7 uh, locking screws into the distal fragment, which gives it a good hold. And here's a bilateral fracture, one more lateral than the other, where we use these lateral plates to get them to heal adequately with good function as well. So I think these plates are definitely an advantage. And now they are coming up with these uh, plates with uh, the variable angle locking, which will give an ad additional dimension to how you can use these. So with that is the basic uh, uh, fresh fractures it can mostly be managed conservatively, but you need to look at which patients will 
benefit from early internal fixation. Then we come to non-unions. Of course, there are other complications like implant problems, implant jetting out, uh, wound problems. I'm not going to discuss all that in detail, but we'll talk about uh, non-unions and the various risk factors. We all know that are the severity of the initial trauma, marked displacement, soft tissue interposition. So this is something that has been found in a lot of the non-unions where one fragment gets uh, impaled onto the trapezius and therefore there's a, a muscle in between the fragments which prevents healing. Um, if you've operated on them, and we'll show you a couple of cases where the initial fixation, if it's not good, will lead to non-unions and implant failures. And of course, as I mentioned, open fractures would all usually have a uh, greater trauma or uh, uh, velocity of trauma, and therefore will have a greater chance of non-unions. So there are various studies which showed that uh, the severity injury or the amount of displacement really uh, in, uh, sort of influence the incidence of non-union. And this was the question which we discussed about the trapezius being interposed between the fracture site, which contributes to the non-union. So when do you uh, intervene? I think a lot of these uh, non-unions may be asymptomatic and especially the atrophic non-unions. So in this study, they looked at uh, uh, the number of non-unions which were symptomatic uh, enough to need surgery. And in the atrophic group, only three of the 11 patients were symptomatic enough, while in the hypertrophic group, almost 16 of the 22 needed surgery to, for the symptoms. Okay, so what they feel is that the absence of callus uh, would diminish the grating and crepitation that may be responsible for pain in the hypertrophic non-union. So they suggested that for atrophic non-unions, even if they are symptomatic, wait for at least six months before you decide on surgery. While for the more uh, sort of hypertrophic type of non-unions, which are painful, it makes sense to go to do surgery uh, straight away. So what are the problems they have? Pain is one of the most common symptoms. Neurological symptoms, okay, we've had a few patients who've had uh, features of uh, brachial plexus irritation rather, uh, or even uh, uh, with the sort of vascular irritation of, uh, with, a, uh, with a positive Hansen test. Not many, but a few. And these are something which you need to look at. Now, the disability may be different. So if, like I mentioned, I talked about the first time we decided to deal with a non-union was a patient who played the tabla. He was a professional tabla player. And he said that he just couldn't play the tabla. So this movement that he had to do to um, play the tabla was something which was causing him a problem. And that was the first non-union many years ago. Uh, I think it's more than 20 years ago that we operated on and then he went on to heal satis satisfactorily. And since then, we've had uh, we've operated on a lot of non-unions, uh, some with managed conservatively and some which were treated uh, non-operatively. Okay. Again, the location of the fracture may have something to do with the risk of non-union as well as the primary internal fixation. Now, when you're treating them, what are the important things? I think you need to restore the length. So depending on the fracture, if it, how late it is, what type of fracture it is, you may be able to restore the length uh, to within a millimeter. So within, so if it is more than two centimeters, you definitely need to do something. Uh, less than that, you may be able to get away without uh, restoring fully the length, okay? You should get good stable fixation. You should have vascularized bone. So make sure you freshen the bone ends and bone graft wherever it is an atrophic non-union. Okay, so that's how we approach these non-unions, just like non-unions elsewhere. So here's an example. This was a two-year-old non-union in a young gentleman who had symptoms. He was having pain and was not able to do his uh, sort of regular activities, especially heavy hard work. And we just fixed it here because the displacement was not so much. We could get after releasing all the fibrous tissue, we could get the two ends opposed, get a couple of lag screws and then a plate across. And then we did cancerous bone graft. And here you can see he's gone on to heal with a good function. Here's a lady. This was not so late. This was about three months uh, post injury. So delayed union rather than a non-union. But she was symptomatic. And you can see there's callus 
So we went ahead. Here we used these wires because the fracture configuration was such that we could not put lag screws. And again, this is before uh, the advent of uh, lock plates. So we used a conventional plate, but good stable fixation, three screws, bicortical screws on both sides. And you can see how this gradually goes on to heal with a good function again. Here's another patient. This was about five months uh, uh, post-injury, significant shortening, but here we could get it out to length after release of all the fibrous tissue, uh, get a lag screw and again fix it. And this again goes on to heal, as you can see, uh, with again a good function, almost a full range of function. So there have been studies to look at whether this delay of three months or four months or five months or six months really makes a difference. And they looked at objective measurements of limb function, strength, et cetera, between the ones that were delayed operative intervention for non-unions and malunions, as opposed to those who had primary fixation. And overall, the, uh, the difference was minimal in terms of general shoulder, but the two things that they found a difference was slight differences in dash scores, uh, sorry, uh, not so much difference in the scores, but if we had to do a, a sort of sustained uh, endurance test of the shoulder, that means strength which they had to apply for a long time or for a sustained amount of time, was there was a significant difference. So I think you can get back fairly good results uh, even in the non-unions, but if you really tested them for endurance over a period of time, then there would be a difference between the earlier treated fractures and the late treated fractures. And that goes to uh, say uh, to what we would expect. Now, when patients present very late, this lady presented seven years, and you can see now there's absorption of bone, there's a gap, and there's a shortening of the clavicle, which is significant. Here, you don't try to oppose the ends, you freshen the ends, and then put a cortico cancellous uh, sort of strut graft in between this. So here's the cortico cancellous graft, which has been put along with, uh, this, there's a strut graft along with cancellous graft. This is again, before the advent of log screw, so conventional plate. And because she was osteoporotic, you can see on the lateral side, we used a couple of cancellous screws. Okay, so this is a follow-up, as you can see over time. And she went on to heal well. And this is now a uh, six month, uh, uh, sorry, uh, two, uh, one year follow up on her doing quite well. Okay. Uh, another one, this is another lady with uh, almost a seven or eight year non union, young lady. Again, you can see if you compare the two sides, there's a significant shortening of the clavicle. And here again, you need to get length with a, a strut graft in between with convention with good solid fixation. Here's the CT scan, uh, uh, which we did in this case, just to look at the thing. And here we used the anterior plate with a strut graft in between to get the length right. Uh, this is the patient at follow-up. And you can see how she's got a good function back with uh, the healing of the fracture. Now, coming to more difficult sort of problems, Here's a 24-year-old gentleman. This was the initial fixation. This is what happened within two and a half months of the fixation. And he presented to us six years later. Now you can see how the bones by now are overlapped. Uh, the lateral fragment is quite small. And so there's a problem getting a really good hold. So here was a situation. This is not a common situation where we used a double plate. So we used a superior plate that is the lateral clavicular plate on the superior surface and a contoured plate on the anterior surface. So this is him at follow-up. You can see how he's going on to heal. This is his good function. This was at about six months. And this is his two-year follow-up. You can see how nicely everything has gone on to heal. And of course, he's maintained his function. So some of these difficult situations, you might have to resort to double plating to get the kind of stability you need for these fractures. So here's another one. This was again a very late non-union uh, in a middle-aged person where the bone quality was not so good. So again, we resorted to a double plate. So you can see two plates in two different directions, orthogonal plates. And again, you can see how this is going on to eat. One of the problems with double plating is that it is difficult to 
assess the union because your plate is covering the images in all the different views. And so uh, you have to look at it clinically in terms of pain, motion, etc. very carefully. And at least in this patient, we had to remove the implant because it was a bit prominent and uh, you can see how this fracture has gone on to heal well. So by and large, uh, people have talked about uh, a salvage procedure where they just excise the bump or excise the non-segment uh, of the clavicle. But today, for most of these, we would try to get the clavicle to heal adequately. So this uh, uh, salvage procedure is something that we avoid nowadays, including so people have gone on to removal of the entire clavicle with surprisingly good functional and cosmetic uh, appearances. But this should really, uh, I think today, not be necessary unless it's a desperate situation with severe infection and loss of bone, etc. So many things have been used, including blades, threaded pins, and external fixation. But I think plates and screws, and especially with the locking plates, that's the most common method of use. And these are various studies looking at non-unions. This was a more recent uh, 2012 study, which looked at LCDCP without bone graft uh, for patients who had some kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, hypertrophic non-union. I don't think you should do this for no, uh, atrophic non-unions in the real sense. So I think the lateral end, as I showed again, is a challenging thing. And if you have a non-union of the lateral part of the clavicle, a uh, hook plate is something that we use quite often. The rehab usually means a sling for about four to six weeks. Uh, Passive range of uh, movement exercises which start quite early and then active range of motion exercises for about after about four to six weeks. Okay, and it depends on also on the stability of your fixation. So that's how you would go out and you need to assess x-rays with different views, the healing. So here they mentioned 15 degree cephalic tilt. We actually do both cephalic and caudal uh, along with the AP views, especially where there's any problem with assessing the healing with the standard X-rays. So I think in conclusion, what uh, we would say is that all clavicle fractures do not do well, but I think a, a large proportion of them will do well with uh, conservative treatment. So I think the uh, fixation um, uh, bug is probably a bit over uh, emphasized at moment at the moment, most minimally displaced fractures do well with conservative treatment. You need to try and identify fractures or fracture patterns, which will do it better with internal fixation. Uh, the ideal method is evolving, but I think plates are still considered the gold standard in the fixation of these fractures. Uh, again, non-unions can often be asymptomatic, but not always. So they can be symptomatic. And if they are symptomatic, you need to treat them and treat them with basically the same principles which apply to non-unions of other long bones. That means you need to get good biology and you need to good, get good stability. You need to freshen the bone ends. You need to try and compress the ends together so that you get absolute stability. So if you do all this, your treatment of non-unions will be uh, successful. Otherwise, they can be challenging and if you look at the literature, there are a lot of failures with treatment of these uh, non-unions. We have published on this in the uh, uh, IGO many years ago. Uh, we had a series of 32 cases. This was a long time ago. By now, we have a much larger number of cases, but we haven't looked at them critically more. So with that, I'll stop and um, stop sharing and take questions. Yes. Thank you very much, sir. Sir, uh, we have a question from Dr. Rajan. He wants to know if there is no neurovascular injury or displacement is less than two centimeter, then is, is it okay that we should always do conservative management? So I think uh, there's no such thing as never and always in orthopedics. So if it is an isolated injury, in a young patient who is prepared to wait for some time, okay, uh, because conservative treatment sometimes takes time. The fracture may heal in 
two months, three months, four months, may go up to six months. But by and large, they will usually heal. What I would do is assess them at two months. And if they are sticky, then I would uh, definitely say conservative treatment. I would counsel them for conservative treatment initially. Okay, that is important. I think uh, uh, a lot of surgeons have the tendency to say, oh, this is a fracture, it's displaced, we need to fix it. And patients will often accept that and go ahead and have surgery. But I think you have to be very clear about what your indications for surgery are and where conservative treatment is going to work or is likely to work, give them the option of conservative treatment before you uh, push surgical treatment on them. Okay. Yes. So uh, as you have shown in a few of the, your cases that you are applied the anterior plate and in few that is superior plate. So what is the, how to decide that uh, when you go for anterior plating, because uh, in anterior plating, when it comes for follow-up, it is difficult for us to assess the, uh, actually the bone because it is uh, that overlapped with the plate. So, yeah, so that's why you need to do different views, okay? okay so if you do the three views, you'll be able to see the bone. So there are advantages and disadvantages, okay? Biomechanically, the superior plates have been shown to be uh, a little better, but they are conflicting studies. Uh, in terms of implant prominence, the anterior or anterior inferior uh, plates are better. And the other advantage is you get long screws in the distal part. Okay, so if you measure the length of screws you get uh, and they, in the screws which go from the anterior inferior part, you get screws which are, as I mentioned, 22, 24 millimeters in length, while from uh, the superior in inferior screw lengths are 14, 16, maximum 18. Okay, so longer screws means better hold. Okay, so I think you have to judge by the fracture the kind of trauma. So if it's a polytrauma patient, getting them into a beach chair position can sometimes be difficult. So for the anterior inferior plate, you can do it in the supine position. While for the superior plating, you need to put them in a beach chair position. Uh, if it's a lateral end clavicle, obviously you put the plate superiorly because you have a very little hold on the lateral part. So you can get multiple screws from superior to inferior. Okay, And the plates are designed for that. Okay, so I think uh, the new VALCP, which is a locking plate with 2.7 screws on the lateral part, are designed for anterior inferior use. Okay, so I think uh, by and large, so far I've been using conventional plates which we contour rather than the pre sort of uh, designed plates for the shaft clavicle fractures. For the lateral end clavicle fractures, we use the lateral clavicular plate, which I think is a very good plate, or the hook plate, depending on how lateral the fracture is, how small the lateral fragment is. Okay. So we have one question by Dr. Vasudev. Uh, he want to know, do we need surgery for asymptomatic non-union? Asymptomatic? Yes, sir. Why would you do surgery for someone who's asymptomatic? Okay. So I think if you assess the patient carefully, he has got no symptoms, no problems, then I don't think you need to treat a non-union uh, just because there's a non-union on X-ray. Uh, now, depending on patients, not all non-unions are asymptomatic. I think early on, the general consensus was that all non-unions are asymptomatic, so people would be quite nihilistic about it. But we have found quite often they are symptomatic and there are certain activities they cannot do. So if, depending on their uh, function, so like I said, this tabla player just couldn't play the tabla. So you can have someone who's a sportsman where he can't play tennis or something like that. Okay. So he may be able to do his activities of normal uh, living, but he can't play tennis or badminton or squash or something like that. So I think it's, it's a uh, carefully sort of... Uh, Council decision that you do. But if they're completely asymptomatic, they have no problems, they can do everything they need to do, then there is no indication for surgery. Okay. So, uh, in your lecture, sir, you have told that if there is overlap of 1.3 to 2 centimeter, then 
more than uh, two centimeters. Yeah, more than two centimeters. So then we can consider for surgery. So that's an indi so so all you can say is that if there is more than that much overlap, then the risks of non-union malunion symptomatic malunion go up. It doesn't mean that they will not heal. Okay. Yes. Okay, sir. So, uh, if uh, there is an associated scapula fracture, then how to decide which one to fix? Like a scapular neck with this. So, you have to look at the uh, displacement, sir. Yeah. Okay, so whichever is more displaced, you fix first. And then you can look at the other fracture. Okay, so ideally, I think if, if you need to fix, you should fix both. But if you are trying to fix one without fixing the other, fix the more displaced fracture, then look at the less displaced fracture. Sometimes when you fix the clavicle, that uh, the glenopolar angle may improve, okay? If you've done it early enough, okay? The thing is the scapula sort of gets jammed very quickly. So if it's a few days late, even whatever you do to the clavicle, the scapula will not shift. But in the very first few days, if you do the clavicle, you may get some improvement in the glenopolar angle, which may make uh, fixing it unnecessary. The scapula is grossly displaced, fix the scapula, and then decide if you need to fix the clavicle or not. So um, I remember during your... Yeah, fixing it makes sense to fix both in most situations so that they can start early motion. Yes, sir, uh, in your scapula lecture, sir, you have described if the ring is broken at two places, if at one place we fix it, then ring will be stable. Sorry? So, sir, if that SSSC, that ring is uh, broken at two places, then if we can fix at one place, the ring will be stable. So, sir, is yeah, it but, okay? Yeah. It, yeah, but clavicle fractures on their own, you're fixing. Huh? Okay. And similarly, scapular fractures on their own without uh, the... SSC disruption, you may have to fix. Okay. So it's not just the ring concept. If the ring is broken, that's a reason to fix. Okay. okay. But just because you fixed one part of the ring, if the other fracture is displaced, you still need to fix it. Okay. So uh, one question from Dr. Jishan that uh, we can treat all pediatric clavicle physial injury. Uh, with conservative one, this is the question, sir. So clavicle fractures in the pediatric, pediatric age group, by and large, are treated conservatively. Okay, now the physial injury is a so there is no true physis in the clavicle. Okay, it's it. How does the clavicle ossify? Yes, so that is membranous ossification. Yeah. Okay, so you don't have uh, the two growth ends and. Uh, Epiphysis and uh, okay, yes. but there is the bone does grow. Okay, so it's only the open fractures or ones with vascular injuries that you would normally consider for surgery. Otherwise, they are mostly treated conservatively, and the results of conservative treatment are excellent. So the very good results which Roe and uh, 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 Nia showed in their papers included a lot of children. That was one of the reasons why they had much better results with conservative treatment. So by and large, of course, there are exceptions. Like I said, never say never or never say always in orthopedics. So uh, if you please uh, explain that how to put a hook plate, sir, because that is a little confusing. So the hook goes posterior to the clavicle under the acromion. Okay. So the plate yes. is designed so where you have the plate coming like that and the hook comes out on one side. It's not directly in line with the plate. It comes one side and out. So that part goes posterior. You have to make a space under the acromion in the subacromial space and fit the hook in there and then put the plate. So when you put that plate down, the hook will, uh, the part of it will impinge on the acromion or hit the acromion and push the clavicle down when you fix it down okay so that's how it works 
So uh, you have explained in your lecture that we can put was worth a screw with hook plate. So is it we should put it with uh, that's in, not with something that plate or? so Bosworth screw originally was a sort of a treatment on its own for uh, acro AC. AC, some dislocations or fractures where the uh, medial part had sprung up a lot. Huh? Now, by and large, it works in certain situations, not in all situations. Okay, so I think where in spite of the hook plate, you have some doubt whether the medial part is coming down enough. I would add a screw into the coracoid. Uh, the other options are uh, some of the more newer methods of fixation like tightrope or uh, fascial sling or something like that or even a, a suture tape onto it to hold the uh, hook of the coracoid with the under with the clavicle to keep it down. Okay, so uh, there is still uh, no clear um, study to show which is better than the other. But uh, remember, so when you put a hook plate, you need to take it out. So the Bosworth screw also very often needs to be taken out. So you can do the taking out at the same time. So you're not adding uh, an additional surgery to the process. So uh, one more thing in the literature that just fixator is also described for clavicle fracture too. Yeah, so the external fixator is a category which I... Uh, would personally hesitate to use in the clavicle. There are two reasons. One is the pins need to be bicortical. So you have to be really, just like in the drilling, you need to be careful. But with K-wires, I'm a little more scared about the pointed end of the K-wire going in too much and you can't cut it off. Okay. So that is something I would avoid using and no one likes an external fixator. But there are some people who've used it with good results and uh, I don't have a problem with them using it. I personally, I'm not something that I would use. Okay. So uh, one more thing is about the middle end of clavicle fracture. Uh, actually, I have seen one or two cases when you yeah, were so doing... Medial end is... So what, uh, yeah. Basically, if they are displaced, they need fixation. The problem is uh, we don't have a... Uh, plate which is designed for that. So you have to manage with whatever plates you have, okay? And try to fit it into that, okay? So usually we would use a conventional plate or uh, add a uh, sort of a plate with multiple screw options at the one end huh? to try to, but you need to mold it a little bit to fit it on the medial side as opposed to the lateral side, which it's designed for. So that is for but superior applications? One is not very common. And second is, uh, you need to be careful about your drilling again, very careful because you have the large veins just behind it. And, okay? and there have been uh, complications. I think uh, a few years ago in uh, Australia, they had two patients who died of bleeding following clavicle fixations. Believe it or not. So the drilling went straight into one of the vessels. And uh, they actually bled. So, sir, uh, we should drill it uh, through and through, or just one cortex? One cortex will not hold, no. I mean, you can use locking screws in one cortex where you're worried, but you still need one or two bicortical purchase screws. Yes. yes. So, uh, what is the tips to protect that um, while we are approaching that supra clavicular nerve branch? As you like I said, I don't worry about it. Huh? So I will not, I'll be the wrong person to give you tips for it. <laughs> but, okay. but I mean, again, it's careful dissection, uh, identifying the nerve, and then protecting it during your surgery. Now, the problem is uh, where you have to reduce the fracture, it usually stretches out the nerve quite a lot. Uh, so personally, I have not been trying too hard to serve, uh, to protect them, to preserve the nerve. So I believe that if you cut it straight through, it's better than stretching it out badly. Okay, And they don't seem to have any significant post-operative sequelae of that. So that's what I've found. I have started asking my patients about whether they have any problems of anesthesia or paresthesia. Anesthesia, a little bit of numbness, most of them can cope with. 
but paresthesia can be a problem and paresthesia is more likely with stretching than with cutting okay sir uh, in your lecture sir uh, you have explained two views for the cranial one is uh, 20 degree and another one is 45 so degree are different views which have been described okay no sir uh, i just want to know sir uh, which one we should prescribe like uh, border view is 45 I think Quesada's view will give you a full this thing, na. No? It's just forty-five, you know, forty-five. Train your radiologist to do it. Okay, sir. So forty-five degree cranial it and forty-five. Just like you do in the pelvis, na. No? Okay, okay, sir. No? Yes, sir. So even for the follow-up, sir, because the shortening we have to see, we should take the comparative view for AP. Not for follow-up. I think when you assess them first, you should ideally do that. To if you think there's significant shortening. then do sir. both sides x-rays okay and uh, once you've treated it again you might do it to compare it okay but uh, what's more important is function yeah and so uh, according to you sir which one uh, we should prescribe like sling or figure of eight so what do you think sir usually i put the sling usually but when to put the clavicle brace i'm not so i think i think uh, so there have been a number of papers looking at it and all of them say that there's no significant difference okay so a sling is what we use in most situation sometimes in the initial first few days when the patient presents just bracing them back uh, is something which uh, helps to kind of reduce the fracture to some extent but i don't think it remains there okay so in real terms uh, there's not much difference Uh, if a patient uh, is having more pain relief with a brace than a sling you can try it but by and large i don't think there's too much difference so a sling is kinder than a brace in most situations thank you very much sir okay uh, it was great sir and thank you very much for the okay so oh, it's already past 8 o'clock yeah okay. yes sir okay thank you very much and bye thank you sir thank next you, week sir. is on tuesday na no? Yes, sir. Tuesday, sir. Uh, that Palser is taking on the okay. yeah, yeah. controversies of the spine case, presenting spine cases. Okay. Take. Thank you. Sir.